Good morning. It is 11.02, almost not even morning anymore, a.m. on Sunday, September 6th, 2020. I'm Christiana Ellis, and I've been up for a little bit. This is five more minutes because it is Sunday. I'm continuing my rewatch of The Legend of Korra with Book 2, Episode 11, Night of a Thousand Stars. This episode is frustrating um, because on the one hand it has some stuff in it that I just absolutely adore but it also has some of some stuff which just feels like so emblematic of some of the other issues with this season mainly character reactions that don't really make sense or them trying to pull drama out of stuff that they haven't really set up properly and it's a struggle for that reason like um you know case in point so the the big let's let's just kind of walk through it and we're, we'll cover both elements of those things right so we begin with uh you know uh cora and tenzin and and uh the family returning to the term the eastern air temple even though janora wasn't able to return to her body they don't know what to do. They've got to do something. Um, I feel like it's left a little bit confusing. That had, wasn't there a whole thing with um, the astral, you know, like projection, the spirit projection, where like you're not supposed to move their body. I can't. I couldn't actually remember if that was a thing in this. In this, but I mean, at the same time, I suppose like it maybe it's just an element of like they just figure that, you know, they're, <laughs> you know, what they can't just leave her body where it is unprotected and they don't want to have everyone else stay where they are. It, it's unclear, but it's also, uh, Tenzin, although he seemed mad at Korra last time, I suppose, I don't know that I wanted him to stay mad at her, but he just kind of switches to being mad at himself for not being able to protect her. But then everyone's kind of just moving on and it just feels a little bit like rushed and like it, it, it doesn't feel like there's a plan for what to do other than, you know, it almost feels like a loss rather than an ongoing problem. And I don't know, it just feels a little bit awkward. Um, but in the meantime, we also have Bolin go and visit Mako in prison. And this is a perfect example of a scene that just like, what what's going on in Bolin's head that he can't help, well, the, like the way that he acts the way he does, right? Because first of all, <laughs> you know, he basically writes off everything Mako is saying as, oh, good, yeah, the insanity defense, that'll be great. And it's like, really, Bolin? Like, even if you, th like, even if you don't believe his theory, continuing to write it off as the insanity defense, as though he can't tell his brother is sincere and doesn't seem to have, like, even if we want to take for a given the idea that he thinks Mako is incorrect about his plan, I would think he would be dismayed that Mako is continuing to insist something that's not true and that unfairly targets someone he thinks is good. Like that makes more sense. But instead of just going, ha, ah, yeah, the insanity defense, that'll be great. And, and like acting like that's not a problem. And it's like he's trying to just sort of brush past this idea that his brother is literally in jail for who knows how long. And he, we, we also have Bolin just pass on, oh, Asami didn't want to visit you because you being in jail reminds her of her father. And it's like, okay, well, that feels vaguely like something that could be true. But why do we not see that from Asami? We don't see Asami say anything like that. We only hear it through Bolin, and that just doesn't feel right. And again, it's like the problem, I think, with that whole this whole plot line is that uh, th th I'm, I'm going to basically crib from Film Crit Hulk's write-up of these episodes because I think he hits the nail on the head exactly with this plot line is that 
there is, you know, there's plenty of stories where the whole plot is that, you know, only one man knows the truth and nobody will believe him and he's doing everything he can to convince them, but he can't and all of that sort of thing. Like there's lots of stories told that way. But for the drama of that to work, we have to be with that character. Whereas this show, like, it's so hard to be in Mako's head, right? Because the show keeps really spinning all of these scenes almost like from the perspective of the other characters who are frustrated with him for not letting it go. And it just feels awkward, and I don't believe Bolin's reaction, and it continues to be frustrating that Lin is so um, oblivious, like, that, you know, she takes the word of these other two detectives over Mako's and doesn't even follow up on anything. And, you know, like, that finally changes in this episode, but it just, it feels so, you know, just hand-wavy. It's frustrating. Um, but in any event, um, the one thing that does kind of linger from this scene is that Mako just does, I guess, get through to Bolin a little bit in the sense of, um, you know, keep an eye out. Something's going to happen during this big premiere and you need to keep your eye on, on Varric. And so then we have the, this whole, uh, you know, and I think maybe like the one the one explanation we could maybe give for what's going on with Bolin is that he's he's in denial about how bad everything is, and he's kind of trying to spin like everything's actually okay. Like so, maybe this whole thing of his insistence on the insanity defense is this like he is trying to fantasize in his head the only possible thing that could actually make this all okay, which is that. An insanity defense might work, but it's something Mako is doing on purpose, and so he's not really crazy. It's all just, like, he's trying to invent a fantasy version of these events where everything turns out okay. Like, I could kind of buy that, but it's just not, like, dramatically established that, that that's what's going on. Especially since Bolin is just shown to be kind of oblivious to a lot of things, you know, like for one, we, he hasn't seen any of the signs of Varric being uh, shady uh, or hasn't noticed them at least. And then we also have this whole plot line of him continuing to think that he's a couple with Ginger just because everybody else says so. There's a little bit of singing in the rain there uh, too, you know, especially she's kind of casually rebuffing him, you know, just like saying, nah, we're not a couple, get it through your head. And so this whole premiere is presented as like, it's going to be the big thing that's hopefully going to convince President Raiko to commit troops uh, to the Southern Water Tribe. And unfortunately, like in a large respect, uh, it all kind of backfires hugely because, you know, what we see by the end of the episode is that Korra and Tenzin and company show up to try to ask for the same thing but it has just been established that one of the other major figures pushing for that very thing was actually conspiring all along, doing other sorts of attacks and attempting to kidnap the president, all in order to achieve this same effect of commit troops to support the Southern Water Tribe. So the president is going to be kind of profoundly unsympathetic to that particular point of view right then, right? It kind of totally backfires. Um, but in any event, so we continue to have those, two, you know, Lu and Gong, the two other detectives be, you know, I think the intent is comically useless, but the frustrating thing about that is they're so comically useless that it just remains um, incredible that um, Lin doesn't see that Mako's the one that's actually knows what's going on. It's really frustrating. Now, what I will say, though, is the greatness in this episode is the whole bit where Bolin is fighting off this kidnapping attempt while his movie is playing in the background, and the parallel action between them is amazing. I love that sequence. It's so good. And I also really like getting Bolin to be able to get to be the kind of the hero, the actual hero 
And I also like that that's set up from he does have these lingering feelings of doubt, like it doesn't think, you know, things are going so well, except it doesn't feel right because Cora and Mako aren't there. Rocket, come on. Hey, Rocket, no, come. Rocket, come. Sorry, he's chewing on stuff. Um, so, you know, it is his lingering doubts and uncertainty about all of this that leads him to be outside where he notices the boat and so on, and that's how he spots it all. And, you know, it, it I don't know, maybe it's trying to be subtle, but what it kind of achieves is not subtlety, but rather just not actually showing anything. Rocket? No. Rocket, come. No. Sorry, just like he comes to me when I call him and then immediately goes back to what he was doing. Um, yeah, so, I mean, we get the fun stuff of um, all the action sequence and all that's great. And it's nice to finally have the other shoe drop that, um, you know, uh, in front of everybody, Bolin is able to make the guy admit that Varric paid him. Um, and so finally that is, uh, you know, established. Uh, Varric is about to try to leave, but he is apprehended by Lynn. It's all good. And, you know, so hooray, the, the day is saved, sort of. You know, Mako is vindicated, so he gets released at least, and that's good. Um, Varric is put in jail, although it's amazing. It's an amazing detail that because he and his company built the prison, he specifically built a fancy prison cell for himself because he figured he would be arrested at some point. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, I yeah, I I can I and I can just imagine too that like he would have like put in the contract somewhere in there that like oh yeah and here's this special cell and it's part of the contract with the city that if if you know that cell is to be reserved if for only him. If that ever, uh, you know, if he was ever to uh, be in prison and like, you, you know, they could have codified it into law. And I, I think that's amazing. It's fun. And so we, you know, he's able to, you know, he has this battleship that nobody knew about that he can give to Team Avatar, I guess. And again, it, it all just feels kind of very, you know, wishy-washy, like it's not clear what the plan is exactly because on the one hand like isn't the whole reason that they couldn't get to the southern spirit portal is because Unalak has all of his military surrounding and guarding that one but now the northern one is open too and I know that's I guess the base of operations for Unalak but and I, you know, maybe it's just too far away or something, but like, it just, there's not a lot of discussion of what actual plans are, but it's more like, hey, no, I guess we didn't get the army that we wanted, but we get a battleship, I guess. Who's operating this battleship? Varric's crew, I suppose. But then they, they don't actually go, it's fine, it's fine. Um, so while there's an amazing action sequence I like, I like all the stuff with Varric. Um, I like that Marco is finally vindicated. But then we also have Korra show back up. And then they just sort of conveniently establish that she remembers almost everything but forgot that they broke up. And that is just such a frustrating way to go with that scene because, like, it doesn't, it's not set up or established in any way that some of her memories are still hazy and maybe she doesn't remember, remember that. Like, I just feel like, wouldn't it have been so much easier? She does not know that Mako got back together with Asami. How, honestly, how could she know? Because as Bolin pointed out in a previous episode, she has only been gone a week. Um, so wouldn't it be better if she's just so happy to see him that she kind of spontaneously goes up to kiss him and maybe instead of just not remembering that they broke up she could say like I'm sorry I know we had that fight but I just I'm so happy to see you again and we see him reluctant to let her go 
especially since she's being nice and not, you know, unreasonable, uh, again, um, like to have all of that, um, at the same time, uh, you know, instead of just like, Oh, I forgot. And him not correcting her. Like, I feel like you didn't have to have, Oh, she doesn't remember that they broke up. It's so bogus anyway. So, um, the last bit we have too is Tanrak, you know, tries to storm the city and gets, he's right back over there. I swear, I swear this little dog. Rocket! No. No. You know that. Um. So, yeah, Tonrock gets captured by Unalak, I guess. I, it's fine. <laughs> you know, I just mean, like, that that whole sequence feels so superfluous. And, in fact, in the commentary, <laughs> when it cuts to that final sequence, the, the directors of the show literally say, oh, yeah, I always forget this part's in the show, <laughs> in the episode. <laughs> Because it just feels so extra. Like, we didn't even need to have that in the show. Like, we could have just had um, had it established at some point that, like, when Korra arrives, it's like, you just say, oh, yeah, no, they tried to attack and got captured. And I suppose then we might have complained that we didn't get to see that. But I just mean the way it plays out just feels unnecessary to see it anyway. Uh, so yeah, this episode, like I mostly talked about the negative stuff, but again, the action sequence where Bolin is fighting alongside his parallel in, in the Nuck Tuck mover is just so great. It makes me so happy that I wish the rest of the episode was as good, so it could not be a frustrating episode. But anyway, we've only got three episodes left of, of um, book two, and then book three is better, so let's... We'll keep on trucking. So we'll be back next week for the 10th episode, or excuse me, the 12th episode, Harmonic Convergence. And I'll talk to you all tomorrow for five more minutes.